Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to day four of the Iowa Cancer Summit. Um, my name is Rachel Schramm, and I work as a senior outreach coordinator um, here at the consortium, and I use the pronouns she and her. Um, as we get started today, I would like to invite you to, again, um, turn on your video for a little bit if you want to say hey um, and introduce yourselves during the chat tool. Um, and again, we're still looking for a member that has the closest connection to Kevin Bacon. So if you want to put that in the chat, we'd love to know. Um, this day would not be possible um, without all of our sponsors. And so we just wanted to extend a very special thank you to all of our event sponsors, um, especially those platinum um, and gold sponsors for making this possible. We couldn't do it without you. So the Iowa Department of Public Health, the University of Iowa Holden Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the Iowa Oncology Society. Um, plus, we have other sponsors like Above and Beyond, Iowa Oncology Research Association, Meskwaki Health Clinic, Pfizer, Genentech, John Stoddard Cancer Center, Red Shamrock, St. Anthony's Regional Hospital, and One Iowa. We're very grateful for all of you. Um, a few reminders before we get started. We do have nursing and CHES credits available. So um, the today's session of the summit counts for 1.67 nursing credits, um, and all nurses should be getting communication um, from directly from the university about those credits. But should you have any questions, you can contact Kelly Rollins on our team, um, and she's rollins at canceriowa.org. Additionally, we do have CHES credits that are available and 1.67 is also approved for today. So um, just for the time being, you can keep your video on, but as soon as our uh, main presentation starts, we just ask that folks turn off their video and make sure that they're muted um, just so that we can have our full attention to the presenters. All of our sessions will be um, recorded and made available upon the completion of our event. So I would now like to welcome Iowa Cancer Consortium longtime board member and member, Ms. Georgia Hodge, to introduce our first speaker for today. Welcome, Georgia. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Iowa Cancer Consortium members. Glad to be here today and hope you have been enjoying this week of information. As I said, my name is Georgia Hodge. I'm the secretary of the board, okay, Iowa Cancer Consortium board. And I also am a community health worker in the Waterloo, Cedar Falls, Cedar Valley area for an organization called Friends. I go by the pronouns of she, her. And I, I'm honored to be able to introduce to you and to some and reintroduce to others, Dr. Mary Carlton. She is an epidemiologist and health services researcher at the university of Iowa College of Public Health. And she's also an associate director of the Iowa Cancer Registry. She has induct, conducted numerous studies of risk factors em, emphasizing on rural, rural population. She is a co-leader of the Cancer Epidemiology and Population Science Program of the Holden Cancer Comprehensive Center. Remember that she's a member of the American Cancer Society, Iowa State Leadership Board, and she just does so much and gives over and over to help others. And so I would like you now to introduce Dr. Mary Carlton. Oh, uh, thanks, Georgia. Thanks for the nice introduction. Let me see here if I can get the right screen. You see my slides or my email? <laughs> Your email turned it off. So <laughs> enjoy that again. Okay. Now do you see my notes? Yep. Okay, let me swap it when I'm ready to go. Perfect. Okay. And you see my big, big slides? Correct. Yep. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, having me here today. I'm really excited to talk about this project and all the different phases of it. Um, I'm mostly excited because uh, I really would love to hear people's input and uh, ideas after this, because I'd like to say that we did all these phases of research and we did activities and it was a great collaborative partnership and all those things happened. Um, but unfortunately it doesn't end with a nice clean ending with a bow on it that we solved, solved the problem that we set out to solve. So uh, I'm excited to be able to 
present this to this huge community of, of advocates and researchers and policymakers and public health practitioners that I think it's going to take all of us to um, address some of the issues that I'm going to talk about today. So um, my topic is ovarian cancer. Uh, and among cancers of the female reproductive system, ovarian cancer is the deadliest. An estimated 13,940 women died of ovarian cancer in the U.S. in 2020. And among women, it's the 11th most common cancer and fifth leading cause of cancer-related deaths. These are just some images from the Cancer in Iowa report from 2020. Um, most of you are familiar with that report. Usually each year we get to release it uh, with much fanfare during a, a press conference and make sure we get the word out. And unfortunately this report came out right in March of 2020. There was a few competing news items um, around that time. So we did not have our usual press conference. And so unfortunately we did not uh, probably get the wide distribution of that report that we normally got, but we had some great friends in the consortium and and Holden, that really helped us uh, try to get it out. But in case you haven't seen it, um, this shows uh, the figure on the left, age-adjusted incidence and mortality rates of ovarian cancer in Iowa. And as you can see, fortunately, um, both the incidence and mortality have been coming down. Uh, that's due to, due to a few factors, uh, a couple of which are, uh, turns out that um, the birth control pill actually is protective um, against ovarian cancer. And hormone replacement therapy ended up being a pretty significant risk factor for ovarian cancer. So when we kind of figured out to, to stop pushing that quite so much, um, the, the rates of ovarian cancer came down and consequently the mortality rates came down also. Um, and the figure on the right, you can see that the, the five-year survival is really heavily dependent on the stage of diagnosis. Um, if you're lucky enough to get it diagnosed at stage one, that um, people have a really high survival rate, but unfortunately uh, the symptoms of ovarian cancer are pretty nonspecific and such that often it is not detected until later. Uh, and the more advanced stages, which you can see is much lower uh, survival and it's a pretty deadly cancer. Uh, and unfortunately no screening tests uh, of yet that have been proven to be effective for ovarian cancer. And just to sort of splay it out here next to all of our other uh, cancers in Iowa. Um, in this graph, we kind of kind of like it because it gives us the lay of the land here. Um, the blue bar, each bar is a, a chunk of time. Uh, and the blue bars are the incidents, our new cases, and the red is the mortality. Um, so you can see our, we have our big four here, breast, prostate, lung, colorectal. Um, but as we move over to ovarian, still very deadly because of that high mortality rate, you can see it's it's actually quite higher than uh, a lot of the other cancers that are more common above it. Uh, so for ovarian cancer, surgery is the primary treatment. Um, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network experts recommend that ovarian cancer surgery should be done by a gynecologic oncologist. Uh, and a gynecologic oncologist, which I'm gonna abbreviate as GINONC throughout the rest of this talk, is a surgeon who has received highly specialized training in treating cancers that start in a woman's reproductive organs. Um, ovarian cancer patients treated by uh, genonks have better outcomes compared to patients who are not treated by these specialists. However, it was estimated that 15 to 30% of ovarian cancer patients do not receive surgical care from genonc for reasons unknown. So on the left-hand side, uh, again, is just those uh, NCCN guidelines that I referenced uh, that say, uh, treating ovarian cancer may consist of a team of gynecologic oncologists and medical oncologists. And that the NCCN experts recommend that a gynecologic oncologist should perform the initial surgery for ovarian cancer when possible. Certainly there's emergent situations and other situations where that, that is not possible. Uh, but in theory, most patients, uh, non-emergent patients should um, by these guidelines have their surgery by a gynecologic oncologist. And then, um, and then a medical oncologist is usually involved in that care also. Uh, and then the map on the right is from a paper that I referenced here above, um, and it shows the geographic distribution of gynecologic oncologists or genonks. Um, and you can see they're not, not, a, not a geographically distributed bunch. Um, they're pretty much concentrated in large urban areas and where they're 
uh, is a large academic or NCI designated cancer center. And Iowa is no exception. Uh, the bulk of our uh, genonics here are in Iowa City. Uh, we have several here at the university. And then there is one remaining um, in Des Moines. Uh, who unfortunately I think is is at some point on the verge of retirement. So uh, definitely not not well distributed in Iowa. And we have some in the surrounding states. A uh, few um, different health systems in Omaha have them. Um, South Dakota, Mayo, of course, um, and, and around. So this is really a, this project was really a team effort to assess uh, and address ovarian cancer care uh, in Iowa. We really wanted to see did we fall in that estimate that they have of, of women who didn't make it to uh, Genonx, and uh, given that we're such a rural state and and that people would have to travel far to get to one of these specialists, we wanted to um, we wanted to see how that was affecting Iowa's population. Um, so. The CDC had launched an initiative several years ago. I'll, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting out of order here. Recently, a few years ago, the CDC launched an initiative called Implementing Health Systems and Environmental Changes to Improve Ovarian Cancer Care. Um, and that's when Katie Jones from Iowa Department of Public Health called me up and said, we could use some stats for ovarian cancer in Iowa. There's this new uh, funding opportunity. Um, so we kind of looked into that and it happened to be at the time that I had an MD PhD student named Kristen Weeks, who is really interested in ovarian cancer research. Um, so we worked with Katie to, uh, to start looking into that data. And so we decided to go ahead and apply for the funding. Um, so it was a joint effort. Uh, the money went to the Iowa Department of Public Health, and then they distributed it to their partners uh, at the Iowa Cancer Consortium, uh, the Iowa Cancer Registry, and then Holden um, was also a, a partner uh, in this project. And right on cue, I see George Wiener is joining. That's great. <laughs> so um, we fortunately we were selected for this grant along with two other states, Michigan and Rhode Island. Uh, and so the three sites uh, set about to um, do this project in some different ways, and we're able to really learn from each other. So the main gist of that grant uh, from the CDC was really this fourth question here how to overcome barriers of, of the women not getting to gynecologic oncologists. But we were really kind of interested in backing up a little bit and seeing, okay, well, what exactly is the magnitude of the problem in Iowa and our surrounding areas? Uh, do rural women with ovarian cancer have different rates of surgery from a, I'm sorry, from a uh, genot compared to urban women? Like, is there a disparity? Uh, and what are the barriers to getting surgery from uh, a genonc? And then based on that information that we would make a plan on, on how to overcome these barriers. And we were really fortunate of the three sites um, that you know, we had our uh, cancer registry uh, to, to use that data. And it happened to be that um, Dr. Lynch um, before my time had uh, been involved in a study or had agreed to be in a study with the CDC. And they were really interested in looking at this issue in Iowa, Kansas and Missouri. Uh, to collect additional information about women who were diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2010 and 2012. Um, so he and Michelle West and several others at the registry um, had helped collect data on a sample of, uh, in total, 1,003 ovarian cancer patients between those three states. And it was really unique data because usually in the registry we collect, um, we have some information about where a patient gets treatment in terms of the hospital, um, but we don't go a lot, we're not able to go a lot deeper than that with, uh, with what we collect. Uh, we we kind of stick to patient characteristics, tumor characteristics, treatment characteristics, and then track them for survival. Um, but in this study that was funded by the CDC several years ago, we were able to go back into the records and figure out for each person in that sample uh, from Iowa, what type of physician specialty did their surgery? Did they ever get a referral to a gynecologic oncologist? Did they have a consult uh, with, a, with a gynecologic oncologist? Uh, did they have that surgery from the genonc, yes or no? Did they have chemotherapy administered or overseen by a genonc, yes or no? Uh, and then they even tried to document what was the reason. Uh, if there was not a referral or a consult with a, a genonc, what was the reason for no involvement if they could find a reason documented? So it's a really unique and awesome data source that um, the other states working on this project did not have available to them. So Kristen published several papers 
uh, from that data set. But um, overall, for, for the purposes of this project, I just wanted to share a few of them. Um, we found that 17% of women did not undergo surgery by GenOp, and those are um, women in the, again, Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri. Uh, only 73% of rural ovarian cancer patients received surgery from a genoc compared to 88% of urban patients, and that was statistically significant. And then it turned out also that rural ovarian cancer patients were 63% less likely to receive a referral to a genoc uh, for surgery. So it wasn't like they were getting equal number of referrals and the rural people just couldn't make it to the genoc. It was that they're actually not being referred as much um, but among those who did receive a referral to a genonc, rural ovarian cancer patients were just as likely then to receive surgery from a genonc, which sort of led us to believe that if you make the referral, uh, they, can, they can get there or they will get there. Um, and rural women who underwent surgery from a genonc were more likely to receive guideline recommended cytoreduction and complete tumor removal, which are uh, standard of care. So she also followed that up, uh, Kristen Weeks, that is, study, uh, followed that study up with uh, a study specifically on Iowa cancer registry data that we had. Um, and so we studied 675 Iowans diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2010 to 2016 who had received cancer-directed surgery. Uh, very similar to the previous study, 17% uh, of women overall did not receive surgery at a facility with an affiliated genome. So we didn't have that detailed data that we had in the last study, but we could tell where they get their surgery. And we knew um, because we have so few genonks and they're so concentrated in certain areas, we could tell uh, for the most part, uh, if they got a surgery at a facility that didn't have one uh, around, uh, essentially if they got a facility, had their surgery in a facility outside of Iowa City or Des Moines or Omaha or Rochester, the places where we know that they are, uh, we went ahead and made the assumption that they did not have their surgery from, from a gynecological oncologist. So not, not quite as complete of data as in the last study, but very similar results. Uh, and again, 74% of women, rural women, had surgery from a gynecologic oncologist compared to 88% of urban women. And again, rural patients who did undergo surgery by a genonc were more than twice as likely to receive guideline recommended cytoreduction uh, and chemotherapy compared to rural patients who did not. And she also did a survival analysis uh, in the study and found that rural patients who underwent surgery by a genonc had significantly better three-year survival rates than urban patients who did not, uh, did not see the same patterns in urban, uh, urban women. So armed with that data, we knew, okay, this is in fact an issue in Iowa. We are seeing a, that's, that's a substantial amount of, of women not getting uh, to gynecologic oncologists, which is uh, the guideline recommendation, and, and then that went on to impact the type of treatment that they got and their survival. So our next step was to kind of figure out, well, what's, why? You know, we can do a lot of great things with registry data and secondary data analysis, um, but it's real hard to figure out the why. Why is something happening? Uh, and until you talk to people and, and try and figure it out through uh, qualitative interviews and those types of things. So uh, we went ahead and interviewed 13 uh, referring providers uh, or hospital administrators in Iowa about their perceived barriers to referrals for surgery and treatment planning. And then, uh, so we, we did some of those and uh, I'll present the results of that, but still couldn't quite, we knew what they, what they perceived to be barriers, but we felt like what would really help is if we could talk to women uh, who did not go to a, to a gynecologic oncologist and kind of try and figure out from them, why not, uh, basically. Uh, so we asked about their decision-making process and selecting a surgeon hospital for their treatment. Uh, and these women, we did, we did not say, <laughs> we don't want to make them feel like they did anything wrong uh, or second guess uh, what, what, they had, uh, what their cancer journey had looked like. So we did not ask them, why didn't you go to a gynecologic oncologist? We're a little bit more, um, delicate about that and just kind of talked through their decision-making process and asked about a few barriers that we had heard from providers to see if they did in fact endorse those same, um, those same barriers. And these were women, again, that we uh, identified through the Iowa Cancer Registry. We saw that they got their surgery at a place that did not likely have a gynecologic oncologist um, and then uh, went ahead and contacted them. 
Unfortunately, it was a small group, um, as deadly as that cancer was, it was kind of hard a few years after the fact to find uh, a lot of women uh, who could tell us about this. So Kristen did publish another uh, paper on that. I have all the, I pasted all the titles into my slides in case you um, want any of those and I'd be happy to send you the papers themselves. I think just about all of them are out there and published now. So happy to provide those to anybody who wants them. Okay, so I'm going to start off with what we learned from providers. And again, these were um, either like OBGYNs who would maybe see somebody and suspect ovarian cancer or know that they had ovarian cancer and then need to make a referral, or uh, they were administrators in hospitals uh, in cancer centers. So uh, I have a few quotes uh, that I put in here. Um, one person said, my patient feedback is just that it's challenging to go to a big university setting. Lots of people are rounding on the patient. There's just lots of people. It's hard to find it, which elevator to take. Just the functionality of it is difficult. Another said, they just think that the university is such a big place. So they feel like they're going to get lost or it's just overwhelming for them to, to go out there. And I think it's more of a lack of familiarity. And I think there's still a lot of people, especially in the rural areas around Des Moines, that they don't understand why they would have to leave. They think that they should be able to get everything here. Uh, we also talked with providers about um, how much influence they have or that they think they have over where patients get treatment. And they reported that they have a great deal of influence uh, on where patients ultimately go for surgery. And some quotes that uh, demonstrate that uh, are they have a longstanding good relationship with their parents, patients, <laughs> sorry, patients. So patients for the most part are fairly willing to go if we tell them that's the best place for them. And another one said, I think I must be fairly, what do you call it? Charismatic or I don't know, somehow convincing. I don't know which one you wanna call it, but I almost never have a patient refuse. I just phrase it in a way that makes it relatable. Like, hey, this is what I would do for my own family members. So I think that I'm providing you with the care that I think is the very, very best. While I'd love to operate, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the right thing for me to do here. Uh, and another said, I don't really have a hard time influencing them, I guess. There, there was a couple that kind of alluded to uh, that, they, that they've had patients that don't wanna go. And, and I do have a friend who's an OBGYN in rural Nebraska who has said that there are people uh, certainly who, um, who sort of make it sound to the, to the physician like that they, they don't wanna go. But for the most part, for the people we talked with, this was sort of the, the um, overarching theme is that uh, patients go where they tell them to go in the end. Kind of asked them about health system barriers also, uh, her provider to provider communication, those types of things. And they did identify barriers uh, that included poor provider to provider communication, long time to surgery wait times, and a limited number of genonics working in their referral range. I once said, like my nurse yesterday spent an hour and 14 minutes. I was sitting right next to her, so I know she spent that much time trying to get a patient referred where I'd already talked to the genonic. She said it was fine. My nurse got transferred, I think literally eight times. An hour and 14 minutes was just such a waste of my nurse's time. It took her way, way, way too long to do that. And another person said, well, I can think of a particular challenge right now this minute is, I want to talk to somebody down there and I know the process for getting in touch with an obstetrician, but if you have questions about a person, it seems like it's not quite as easy to just ask them questions about what their opinion is. So just sort of issues getting a hold of uh, a provider for advice on what to do. Um, so now we switch over to the patients to see what, from their perspective, um, what do they think were, were kind of the, again, we didn't, we didn't say, why didn't you go or what were the barriers for you going? We kind of had to dance around that a little bit to not make them feel bad about a decision that they made. Um, so we kind of asked them more about, in general, about talk us through your um, deci decision-making process on selecting a surgeon or a hospital. Um, and patients generally reported following their physician's recommendations. Um, one said, for better or worse, I did pretty much what I was told to do. Another said, such and such is our clinic. That's where all our doctors are. We just go there. Just the clinic doctor, the women's doctor. And he decided the surgeon. We don't question. They're good doctors. We don't question what they say is okay. They're good doctors over there. So a lot of trust. Uh, we did kind of ask them, um, did you get a second opinion? Um, before deciding where to have your surgery. One said, I think I totally had a choice. They didn't say we have to do this, but they also didn't say maybe you should get a second opinion. 
I just trusted them from the start. Maybe if they had said, if you want to go get another opinion, we won't be bothered by it. But they didn't say that. And I trusted them. So I stayed with him. And somebody else said, I always feel bad if someone says, get a second opinion. It makes your own doctor feel like you don't trust him. And we also asked, um, you know, how did you know your surgeon was experienced with ovarian cancer? How did, how did you assess that experience level? Uh, one said, I don't know that I asked that about the experience level, but I had a sense of confidence just based on the way that she was talking. Another said, I just know he's considered a very outstanding doctor in lots of different hospitals. And a third said, I probably did at least look up the hospital or treatment of ovarian cancer and so forth. But other than that, I don't think I did. They're talking about doing any kind of online research. Um, so, you know, kind of first reading this, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, why that, that's so unfortunate that people feel like that and why, you know, this is their life. Why aren't they, I would be on the computer. I'd be looking all this stuff up and, um, uh, it was just, uh, it was kind of sobering to then sort of remind myself when I read some of these quotes, like, gosh, the state of mind these people are in is not one of logic, <laughs> not one of like systematic research or anything. They've just gotten this really devastating diagnosis. Uh, and that's what we heard from patients. One said, um, you know, I was so blown away by the diagnosis and not having had surgery since I was 15 years old. At this point I was 80. I had not had any surgery since I was 15. I guess you could say I was in shock. I wasn't smart enough to ask the surgeon how many times he'd done this, but I guess in my mind, I thought if my family doctor recommended him, that should be good. And another said, I just had the worst news of my life. And again, completely overwhelmed. I was shell-shocked, incapable of making decisions. It was all rolling over you like a big boulder. So it was a good reminder that uh, the frame of mind that people are in and, you know, given that trust that they have in their physician, um, it just sounded like they went wherever that person said they should go and they really trusted that was the best place for them. So when we asked them about some of the barriers that physicians or the hospital administrators had perceived, they didn't, they denied those, they didn't endorse any of those barriers. They said they would have gone wherever they were told to go. Um, they specifically denied the prov provider perceived barriers that were read to them as probing questions. They reported they could have traveled and been treated anywhere, and they felt like they had a choice of where to go and expressed a willingness to go wherever the doctor recommended. So again, this is 15 people. So I would love to hear if people know of different experiences, different barriers that we just didn't uncover here. Um, this is qualitative research really meant to get an in-depth understanding of what people were going through, not meant to be generalizable and to say that this represents everybody, um, all women with ovarian cancer in Iowa. But it did seem to corroborate the, what we found in the other studies um, of, of registry data that said, if you in fact got a referral, the rural women went, like there was no more difference between rural and urban women anymore once you narrow the population to those who got a referral to a gynecologic oncologist. It seemed like the breakdown was happening of people just not getting the referral and women not knowing that they were supposed to go to a gynecologic oncologist and feeling like they were trusting their provider to send them to the very best place where they needed to go. So, uh, with all that information, we decided we, uh, by that time, the CDC project, they were antsy for us to hurry up and do something about this, um, now that we had um, a lot of data about what was happening in Iowa. So we started uh, with developing a handout for providers that highlighted the perceived and actual barriers to receiving guideline recommended treatment for ovarian cancer and describes the role and importance of gynecologic oncologists. Uh, we also listed options for referring patients to gynecologic oncologists because we did hear issues about referrals. Um, and I should say in the meantime of all this, I did talk with um, Michael Goodhart, who's one of the gynecologic oncologists at the university. Um, and he said, you know, it, he understands the perception of having a hard time referring to the university. Of course, with all these quotes, we don't know if they're talking about the University of Iowa, if they're talking about Mayo, if they're talking about UNMC. Um, or Des Moines, it, it, we, we don't actually know um, and didn't share back with for confidentiality and privacy reasons, didn't share any of those back with uh, any of the hospitals. But in general, he understands that the university can be a challenge, but he says he gives out his cell phone number. Um, most do, a lot of the referring providers have that. Um, 
that they usually can see patients within a week. Uh, he thought while they're incredibly busy that between them and Dr. Elg in Des Moines, that we did have just enough gynecologic oncologists to see all of the women with ovarian cancer within a week uh, and get them, get them rapid treatment. There did seem to be a breakdown though in how fast the, the perception of how fast that could happen and whether women were um, getting in in a timely manner. Um, so we talked through a lot of that and tried to really understand the referral process and make a handout that kind of explained it and tried to make it simpler for, for providers who were doing the referring. Uh, so that was one of the points, um, points of this handout. And we reviewed the handout with uh, the gynecologic oncologists. Uh, we sent them to the ones here at the university and to Dr. Elg in Des Moines uh, and OBGYNs uh, across the state where we could find, uh, find ones to uh, review these for us and give us feedback. Um, and then once we finalized those, uh, I bought a list of all the OBGYN clinics in Iowa uh, and Nebraska, I think. And so um, mailed these handouts, mailed stacks of these handouts to all the offices so that they could be distributed um, to patients. Um, so, uh, or actually, sorry, we mailed these, these are not the patient ones. <laughs> we just mailed these so the providers would have them. Uh, we also have them posted on um, the Iowa Cancer Consortium website. If you're interested in um, downloading those, they're there. Uh, we, we're also happy to print them off and send them to uh, anybody that we may have missed uh, in our mailing campaign. This is just a snapshot of that handout. And this, again, this is, a per, this is a handout meant for providers being the audience uh, where we remind them that research has shown that women are more likely to receive standard of care when they are treated by gynecologic oncologists. Um, and we have um, the phone numbers uh, that we confirmed with the different places that we know have uh, gynecologic oncologists. Somebody did recently point out to me, I missed, uh, I have UNMC on there, but there's a couple other, I think CHI and maybe a legion uh, or one of the other health systems in Omaha has gynecologic oncologists and we need to add them to this. Uh, and we told them about, you know, we hear, we heard from providers that um, they perceived that patients didn't want to go uh, to these large centers where the gynecologic oncologists tend to be because of uh, long wait times and reluctance uh, to seek care and travel and costs and all kinds of things. But we asked them and they did not. <laughs> the, women we, the women reported in interviews, they were not referred to a gynecologic oncologist by their diagnosing provider. And that was the barrier. Um, in addition, patients uh, who did not receive care by a gynecologic oncologist indicated they did not consider the above to be barriers in seeking care. They expressed their trust and confidence in the diagnosing providers and did not think they needed a second opinion uh, or to see another doctor for treatment. And again, provided some of those powerful quotes about they're, they're going to do whatever you tell them to do. So please tell them to go uh, see a gynecologic oncologist for their, for their surgery. Um, and did want to point out too, it's not the gynecologic oncologist does not have to administer the chemotherapy. A lot of times that's a collaborative arrangement um, where they can, patients can get their chemotherapy oftentimes closer to home, but there are some specialized chemo um, uh, administration that does need to be done uh, at a large center, but by and large, they can work with local providers to get that done uh, oftentimes locally. So it's really just a surgery where they, they need to get to a gynecologic oncologist and then have that person play a role in uh, managing the, the chemotherapy, which can be administered closer to home. Um, so we also recorded uh, webinars, like free web webinars that gave um, free CME to providers. Uh, we did one that was specific to Iowa and addressed the state of ovarian cancer in Iowa, promoted the benefits of surgical referrals to, to Genox for ovarian cancer from the perspectives of an ovarian cancer survivor and a gynecologic oncologist, uh, Megan McDonald from uh, the university's uh, gynecologic oncology division helped us out with that. And uh, we also participated in an ovarian cancer roundtable webinar with Rhode Island and Michigan, uh, which is really interesting to hear the different approaches in the three states and how similar the barriers were um, and, and the different approaches people were taking to um, try and improve this process in their states. So these are just screenshots of um, those. And I think they're still available. Uh, if you go to the Brown 
um, since we partnered with Rhode Island, the, the Brown Medical School uh, CME unit put those on for free. Um, but if you have any trouble accessing them, please let me know and I'd uh, love to get you the, the link to that. I don't know that they're, they're still available for actual CME credit, but, um, uh, but I'm gonna talk about a, a new CME opportunity that's coming up um, through the Normalia uh, initiative. So how about patients? Um, I mean, it did seem like really the biggest bang for the, for the buck was to, to somehow intervene with referring providers. Um, and I think changing referral patterns is one of the hardest things um, to do and, and things at least that I've studied. Uh, so I think there's a lot more work to be done. And unfortunately the pandemic sort of hampered the types of visits that we were planning to do um, with providers across the state. and and really some kind of provider relations types of things uh, that we would like to do. Um, if anybody's at, at a health system or clinic or anywhere in the state and is interested in, in having one of the gynecologic oncologists either from the university or, or elsewhere, uh, like from, from a different center, we're happy to try and facilitate that. I think that's really what it's gonna take um, to, to educate providers across the state one-on-one -on -one and get them feeling comfortable with referral processes and things like that. And, and for the, for the people in the gynecologic oncology departments to really hear what the issues are in terms of communication and why people may be reluctant to refer. Um, but uh, we did go ahead and develop a educational handout for patients uh, to help improve awareness, uh, patient awareness with ovarian cancer, um, which uh, talked about the, the critical importance of requesting a referral to gynecologic oncologists. Uh, to help them identify questions about treatment options that they should ask their healthcare provider, um, things like that. And the thought was that we would, we would distribute that online, but also we, th this is what I uh, accidentally brought up earlier. We sent large packets of these handouts to, again, all the OBGYN offices uh, on the list that we, we were able to purchase um, throughout the state so that the, provide, the referring provider had something to give the patient to help explain why it's so important, why you need to travel in case that is a barrier for some people and they really don't wanna go um, to really explain why it's so important. Um, and we tested the handout with six ovarian cancer survivors uh, to obtain their input and feedback and that was really helpful. And I'll talk about how we were able to recruit those survivors with help of our key community partners like Jody at Normalia. Um, so we mailed those out. Uh, and again, we, our, our great hope was that we would get a lot of really wide coverage from our, our cancer in Iowa report in 2020 featuring ovarian cancer. But um, as with many things, the pandemic ruined, it kind of ruined those plans a little bit. But we, we were able, we did produce the report. It is out on our website. We did try and get um, broad distribution via uh, the internet and some of our other partners, but it didn't quite get the normal coverage that our reports usually get. And here's just a screenshot of part of that handout, uh, which again, here's the, the website. It's up on the Iowa Cancer Consortium website also. Um, so really understanding your ovarian cancer treatment explains what a gynecologic oncologist is, and it has a process for what patients would need to, be, would need to do to initiate a referral to a gynecologic oncologist. It has the information there to try and make it a little bit easier for them. So I really want to talk about our key community partners who we could not have done this without. Um, Jody Kavinsky at the Normal Normalia Ovarian Cancer Initiative. Um, she was wonderful. She provided feedback on all our materials. She helped recruit those ovarian cancer survivors from their support groups to test out and give feedback on the patient handouts. Um, her website has a lot of helpful materials for women with ovarian cancer, either newly diagnosed or ovarian cancer survivors. She has some new resources coming soon, and she has uh, something called the Rule Out Project, which will award one free CME or CEU. Um, so I think that will be in the coming, coming weeks. Um, so if you go to their website and sign up for their uh, newsletter, you can get information about that. Also wanted to say thank you to Bridget Toomey. She's an active member of the Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance. Uh, she's also a member of the Holden uh, Community Advisory Board. And uh, has since, uh, since this time, I believe, works in the women's clinic at the university. So we have a great partner to, to keep talking with about to how, to how to make sure we make it as easy as possible for these referrals, uh, these women to get referred into um, the university when, when that's their 
uh, place that they're being referred. And uh, she provided feedback on all materials and, and helped us recruit healthcare providers to test out those um, provider handouts. I just wanted to thank all of our partners, um, Katie and Alan at IDPH, uh, Kelly and, and Rachel, and then uh, Tessa, who used to be at the Iowa Cancer Consortium, uh, really our whole staff at the Iowa Cancer Registry, but in particular, Amanda, uh, Michelle West, Lisa Hunter, and, and Suzanne Bentler, it's not listed there. Uh, Holden, again, thanks to Megan McDonald, Michael Goodhart, busy uh, gynecologic oncologist who took time to, to help us, and, and Dr. Eld's nurse, I should have listed her too, she was really helpful in uh, getting information uh, and Tina Devery and George Wiener. And then um, the team at the College of Public Health, Kristen Weeks did a lot of this work. Uh, she's the MD PhD student I mentioned. A lot of great papers out in the literature, which I think will really move this field. And I'm, I'm sure it sounded like we're from Michigan and Rhode Island, we are not alone uh, in this issue. And so hopefully her work will really move, move that field forward and try and figure out uh, evidence-based strategies for getting more women to gynecologic oncologists. Jenny Patterson uh, created the patient and provider handouts. She used to work uh, for the CDC and is just a, a wonderful resource for um, making those types of handouts. She writes them at the exact right level uh, of understanding and she's really experienced and wonderful doing that. And of course, my mentor, Chuck Lynch uh, from the registry and the Department of Epidemiology and Chelsea and Savannah uh, who are students that helped, helped out with this project. So I uh, just wanted to uh, thank everybody and to, to let everybody in the audience know that we would really appreciate any feedback or insight or ideas you have. This is still, um, we did not solve this problem and we know that we need to get those handouts more widely distributed and we know that the handouts are just, just a tool and we need a, a really more uh, a widespread strategy for really moving, moving the needle on this issue. So that's all I have. Happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you so much, Mary. That was a very, very interesting presentation. I have a question already in here. It says, anyway, someone said something about, was there a difference in the outcome of the surgeries from a oncologist and the non-oncologist? Yeah, we don't have a lot of details on the surgical outcomes, but we do know in, in terms of the types of surgeries and surgical approaches that they received, that the women who made it to the gynecologic oncologist were getting the more standard of care approaches like cytoreduction and, and complete tumor removal. Um, so we do know that, and we do know that it did impact uh, three-year survival, So, which leads you to believe that it did in fact impact those surgical outcomes and, and what they were able to remove. I have a question. And you mentioned earlier that um, one of the patients said that when they're diagnosed, they're just so overwhelmed mm -hmm. that they just don't think of that. And that goes back to a thing that I've always um, wanted to implement is people having a navigator or a person with them. Mm -hmm. But when you're first diagnosed, you know, you're, uh, everybody's going to be overwhelmed by just the word cancer. So I should think they, they should come back before they discuss that because you're going to be overwhelmed yep. and always have someone with them. So I think we still need to implement that into people that are going through life altering physical conditions like that. They're not, they're, in, they're not going to comprehend. So they're not going to know what's best. Yep. I think that's exactly right. And I think that that is where we really need to target a lot of the efforts because it's easy when you're overwhelmed to just go with, to trust your provider. You know, what do most people know about ovarian cancer? Not, not a lot. Um, so, and it, and it tends to hit at age, older ages where they may not be as comfortable with logging onto the internet and doing all kinds of, of research. And again, you saw us, maybe it's a problem everywhere. Maybe it's especially a problem in Iowa. This thing about women uh, or Iowans thinking, I don't want to offend my doctor by getting a second opinion, those types of things I think we all um, struggle with. So uh, I think you're exactly right that that's the point at which uh, an intervention like a advocate navigator, something to help people understand what they need to do uh, in that time of need is huge. Mary, uh, this is Miriam Tyson. And I remember um, my diagnosis, I didn't have ovarian cancer. But my providers always had somebody in the room 
who took notes. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was trying to take notes and they're like, okay, no, we'll, we'll just take the notes for you. Um, but I thought about what Georgia said and I was thinking about it as you gave your presentation. People get, some people just get so overwhelmed that they can't process anything. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the reason why um, doctors um, don't wait is maybe because of their patient load and the cost of having somebody come back a second time. And my question is also is, why don't they refer the, their patients to a gynecologist, oncologist? Yeah, I think that's a great, that's kind of the million dollar question, Miriam. I, I totally agree. And I agree with your, your first point too, but uh, in terms of your second question and also what, what um, I think Dr. Weiner put in the chat about, have you considered a survey of general um, gynecologic oncologists about reason they do or do not refer? Uh, and, and we definitely have, I will say like of all the provider groups I've worked with in, tr in terms of trying to do interviews or surveys or anything like that, they were tough. <laughs> they were tough just to find the people to talk to. That was the most like impervious group of clinicians that I've ever tried to crack into. So I agree that would, that would definitely be the way to go, but I don't know how to get a decent response rate out of that because it, I mean, even just trying to do some brief interviews and working through word of mouth, it was really hard to pin down people in the, in the community and even people at the university, it was really hard. Uh, but, but that's not to say it shouldn't be done because I think that's a big question. And I do think there are, again, cases of emergent, uh, there are emergent cases. There's some percentage that we will never get uh, to a gynecologic oncologist because of those uh, kind of emergency circumstances. Uh, yeah. but, but I do think 17% is awfully high for people not getting to a, to a genonc, but that's a great, uh, great question, Dr. Weiner. And, do we, and I, I wonder, Mary, if, if a general gynecologic conference where there's a captive audience and you give them a clicker to say yes or no, might be a way to try to get that data as opposed to uh, reaching out. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. I think we do need to really understand what that is and you know, there may be, uh, there may be OBGYNs that have some specialized training. And so they, they feel like that that's within their scope of practice. That's something that we didn't really get to explore much. Yeah. Um, but again, it was, when we look at the, through the registry, it's kind of all over the state. It's not, we couldn't, we could find a few areas where it seemed to be a particularly concerning, but it was a thing sort of disseminated throughout the state. So um, I think it is going to take something like that to try and figure out what's happening. Do we have a directory of um, the gynecological um, oncology? Yep. Because maybe that would help, you know, yeah, and that's to have some kind of directory where yeah. we list them for the doctors. Because sometimes I, some doctors might not even know where they are yep. or who they are. I think that that was exactly what we were kind of trying to address with those handouts by saying, here's where they are, here's their phone number, here's the process for getting in contact with them. But it's kind of tricky to get that information out. I don't know how much our, uh, we can count the number of clicks on our handouts, but still not sure how many people, you know, opened our envelopes that we sent in the mail or downloaded, you know, and actually use them. So uh, I think we need to work a little harder in, in getting exactly that type of information in the hands of those providers. I have a question. Is there not an oncology gynecologist in the Waterloo area? No, nope, there's not. There, there's only one in Des Moines. Like I said, he's, uh, I think, in danger of retiring in the next few years here. Uh, and the rest are in Iowa City. There are some up in Rochester, but those are the only places. I think that's kind of one of those subspecialties that's, that's pretty tricky. It's got to be at a pretty high volume place. So it is unfortunate that there are not ones. I, I'm not sure if any of them go there, if there's any type of outreach clinic. I don't think that's the case, but that's a good question I should uh, look into. Yeah, we, so UIHC has five. And so they're primarily located in Iowa City, but they do have outreach clinics in the Quad Cities right now is our only outreach, but that is in the future plans to have more outreach locations for them. Thank you, Bridget. Okay, there's a question. When they don't get referred to a 
uh, one of those <laughs> surgery <laughs> referral within the same hospital system instead? Or is this just a way to keep it simple and keep the revenue payment? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I would imagine that it's uh, probably within the same, I would imagine it's an OBGYN that finds the cancer and I would imagine that it's usually an OBGYN that removes the cancer. Uh, I don't know that there's many general surgeons that would attempt that. Uh, I do think it's probably an OBGYN. Uh, so again, I'd sort of like to think that maybe there's some out there that got some specialized training, uh, even though they're not genonx. Uh, so that's sort of uh, kind of that gray area. They're, they're not that type, of can that type of provider. Maybe they have some extra experience. I, th those are kind of the things that we need to, to really figure out because this is one of the one of the cancers, there's not that many, but this is one of the cancers where it's really prescribed in those guidelines of who should be doing that surgery. So. And I think we're just about out of time. So Mary, if people are really revved up about this and want to talk to somebody, are they able to email you or what's the best way for them to get in touch? Yeah. Yep. Emailing me would be perfect. Happy to, happy to answer questions. And I just want to say thank you to uh, um, the doctor who said there's a new Genonc in Zion, Illinois. That's good to know. We can add them to the add them to the list and map. And uh, according to some, there are enough in place here to accept the estimated needs of the state. But I think we could certainly use more. And that is uh, uh, that's probably a topic for another talk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer the questions as I see them here. And people uh, can feel free to email me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Charlton, and thank you so much, Georgia, for for introducing and moderating. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so um, now we're gonna move to our next segment, which is we're gonna meet uh, two more consortium members. So like we said um, earlier this week, we passed the mark, the benchmark of having over 500 members across the state and we're super excited about that. So to get to know each other a little bit better, we're just gonna spend a couple of minutes uh, getting to know two two of them. So I think we'll have Shannon go first, if you're ready, um, you go ahead and take it away. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Shannon Benson, and I am the executive director of Iowa Oncology Research Association. We are a small nonprofit. Um, we are housed within the John Stoddard Cancer Center in Des Moines, and thankful for that location. Um, I just, they gave us such fun questions um, to pick through. I just chose a couple. Typical day for me, um, it's mostly quality assurance and physical related. So super boring stuff is honestly what it is. Um, I never imagined when I went to nursing school, this is what I would end up doing, but it's, it's I guess it's a dirty job and someone has to do it. And so that's, it's something that, that I do for our organization. It can be um, looking at contracts, budgets, things like that. Um, that aren't that exciting, but I really am, um, I believe in what we do. And again, somebody has got to do that part of it. So that's me. Um, what do you see as the major issues and trends in the field today? I chose that question because I thought it was kind of interesting, um, you know, in, in research. So what we do is we enroll patients on clinical trials. And for a long time, that was mostly, um, that was mostly treatment related. And of course, that's still important and still a role, but we also have, um, trials that look at side effects. Um, they're called control trials. And you know, if, if the chemotherapy we give it, we're giving you is causing such horrible nausea and vomiting that you're not able to get through your treatments, then we're not giving you the full treatment that you need. So we have studies that look at side effects. We also have what's called cancer care delivery research. And that is something that I think is um, a big trend. Uh, it's really looking at how do we change the cancer continuum to impact care? And one of the really hot topics right now is um, financial toxicity. So it, again, similar to the side effect, if the, the treatments that are out there are so expensive that, we, that you can't go through your cancer care without having a major financial hardship, well, then you're not probably able to get the full treatment that you need. And that's gonna impact your, your clinical outcomes. So I think there's a ton of work that's being done in that field right now. And again, when I started out in this field, I feel like it was so treatment focused and we've changed gears a little bit and it's a really exciting um, field to be in. And I guess the last thing I wanna leave, leave you with, um, they have on here, a question to ask themselves or a step to take. So I guess I would say, um, well, two things, are you, are you, the question is, are you passionate about the work that you do? 
And a step to take, if you're not, it's not too late. Find something you are passionate about because I we're, we have an um, opening for a nurse and I interviewed a nurse this week and you know, she emailed me the next day and she's like, wow, I just, I, I'm so, I so want to get involved in your company because you seem so passionate about what you do. And I would say that that's true. And I would say it's never too late to find something you're passionate about. So thanks you guys. Awesome. Thanks so much, Shannon. All right. And now um, our next member that we're going to introduce is Christina Hamilton. Welcome, Christina. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everyone. And, you know, Shannon and I didn't plan the both wearing yellow, but that's pretty cool that that happened. Um, I'm Christina Hamilton. I'm the advocacy director for the American Lung Association. I cover Illinois and Iowa. Um, so it's a fancy way for saying that I'm a lobbyist. I lobby on all things lung health policy in both Illinois and Iowa. Our office, our Iowa office is located in Urbandale. Um, I'm based in Illinois, but I've been covering Iowa since last year. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, let's see, what experience led me to my job or my chosen career path? I grew up in the DC area. So I've always been really passionate about public policy. Um, since I was a kid, actually, I've always really believed in the power of public policy and that it is the one of the main ways that you can affect positive change in your community. So I was just, you know, kind of a political nerd and followed things closely, um, even when I was a kid. And then I went to school near DC. So it was just sort of all around me. Um, and personally, I just have had family members go through a lot with the healthcare system and some of the inefficiencies. So I um, was just led to kind of stay in the field and um, just really enjoy being able to enact public policy and work really closely with public health champions that um, really care about our issues. Um, a typical day when the legislature is not in session is I read the news, um, definitely, you know, try my best to stay abreast of what's going on because, you know, meeting with legislators, you want to make sure that, you know, nothing out there is ha happening um, in their districts and just kind of be familiar with what community happenings are to just be informed and mindful in all of our conversations. Um, other than that, it just kind of varies. Um, sometimes I'm doing informal legislator meetings to educate on our issues to kind of lay the platform for um, upcoming session or meeting with coalition partners. Um, you know, our opposition has billions of dollars to oppose our tobacco policies and other things. So we really rely on coalitions a lot to advance our, our issues. So I'm often meeting with um, patients that are affected by lung disease, or some other lung health issue. Uh, air quality is also a big issue for us. Um, a lot of times I'm meeting with coalitions, so we work really closely with um, ICC and the American Cancer Society, Heart Association, and others. Um, I, um, I did want to highlight a couple of our lung cancer awareness um, related programming. Um, with Lung Cancer Awareness Month coming up next month, we're going to be releasing our state of lung cancer report that's, yeah, Save Lung Cancer Report to making sure I got the name right. And I'll also put it in the chat. Um, we also have an initiative called Save by the Scan to educate individuals on what makes them at high risk for lung cancer. Um, and anyone can take that, that test. And it's really brief just to kind of get the basics on what are some of the high risks. Um, you know, I think typically individuals think, oh, I didn't smoke, I'm not at high risk, but there could be other risk factors and just um, we provide education about radon and other um, common risk factors. But um, wanted to share that. And then we also have the Lung Force Initiative nationally. We have been running it um, for a few years now. We um, uh, identify one Lung Force hero uh, from every state um, last year, because it was virtual, we had, I think, three heroes per state, most states, um, including three from Iowa. And we have them, we had them, oh, thank you, Liz. Um, we had um, we had them virtually, you know, meet with uh, their senator and representatives um, in um, DC. Um, and it was really nice that um, Senator Grassley like attended in person and he has on many occasions that we're always surprised. We're like, he's so busy and so senior, but he always makes time to meet with our um, lung force heroes. So these are uh, lung cancer patients, um, caregivers, 
uh, mainly that have been affected by lung cancer. So they are critical storytellers in our work. We've um, typically advocated for improved healthcare access, um, National Institutes of Health funding. Um, we've noticed that there are advances that happen in cancer um, treatment and research that can benefit more than just maybe that specific cancer that's being researched. It could benefit um, lung cancer as well. So we kind of advocate for cancer research and um, support at the federal level as a whole. So, um, so yeah, so that's a summary. I'm really happy to, to be here and um, would love to stay connected. And yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Christina. All right. Well, with that, I think we're going to transition um, to our final presentation of the day. And to introduce our speakers, I'm actually going to turn it back over to Mary Charlton um, to introduce them. So take it away, Mary. All right. Thank you. And I'm so excited to hear their talk. I'll try and make this quick, even though they have a long, uh, lots of accomplishments to read off. But I am so excited to uh, introduce the whole consortium to Dr. Sarah Nash. She is an assistant professor of epidemiology that we just recruited here to the University of Iowa. She was one of my fellow SEER cancer registry PIs. She used to run the uh, SEER Alaska Native Tumor Registry uh, with the Alaska Native Tribal Consortium. Um, and she has broad training in cancer prevention, surveillance, nutrition epidemiology, community engagement. Um, she's been really active with our community outreach and engagement uh, team at Holden. Um, and she just brings a really awesome combination of research and community engagement skills that I was so excited to have in Iowa and so excited to have her as part of the consortium now. Um, and then also another favorite colleague of mine who I just discovered recently, Dr. Katie Robinson uh, is an endocrinology fellow at the University of Iowa. She completed her MD and PhD at the University of Wisconsin uh, she did an internal medicine residency at the University of Iowa uh, and is currently completing her finally, final year of her endocrinology fellowship. Her doctoral work examined the history of the fat acceptance movement and how the medicalization of high body weight presents both opportunities and challenges for those labeled as having obesity. And currently she works with an interdisciplinary team to develop methods to measure and reduce weight stigma in healthcare. And this is a topic I'm so passionate and excited about and uh, can't wait to hear this talk. So take it away. Hello all, I'm just gonna start screen sharing here. Thank you, Katie. I don't think I need to introduce myself. Mary did a really great job. I was going to start and then pass over to you, but I think I can just pass over to you. I agree. I think she did a great <laughs> job. So I'm just going to go ahead from here. Um, so I'm Katie Robinson. I'm excited to talk to you all today, uh, along with Sarah, about weight stigma and cancer care. Before we begin this talk, I think it's really important to um, just talk a little bit about the language we use to describe body weight. Um, there are many different words that we use. According to survey work, patients really prefer the term um, weight or excess weight or overweight and strongly dislike the words obesity and morbid obesity. Um, some individuals have also tried to reclaim the word fat and to use it as a neutral or positive descriptor, but this isn't widely accepted um, and some people still find that term offensive. Um, finally, you know, in the world of medicine, we use the terms overweight and obesity to refer to specific BMI cutoffs with overweight referring to a BMI of 25 to a BMI of less than 30, um, obesity class one referring to a BMI of 30 to less than 35, um, class two, 35 to less than 40, and class three, BMI 40 or higher. Um, although I dislike using language that patients object to, I will be at times in this talk using the terms overweight and obesity because they are more precise and uh, more specific to the medical literature. Um, so first of all, what is weight stigma and why do we care? So weight stigma refers to the social devaluation and denigration of individuals because of excess body weight and can lead to negative attitudes, stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Weight discrimination refers to overt forms of weight-based prejudice and unfair treatment, essentially biased behaviors toward individuals with overweight or obesity. Um, finally, I think it's important to mention weight bias internalization. This occurs when an individual engages in self-blame and self-directed weight stigma because of their weight. Um, 
And internalization essentially includes agreement with stereotypes and application of those stereotypes to oneself. And this could be very detrimental and harmful. Sorry, just there we go. Um, so essentially people face weight stigma, unfortunately, in all aspects of their life. Um, people can face this in their personal lives, work lives, at school, even strangers on the street, um, and also within healthcare contexts. The prevalence of weight stigma increases with higher body weight. Uh, amongst individuals with class one obesity, 19% uh, report experiencing weight stigma. And amongst those uh, in higher classes of obesity, 42% uh, report experiencing weight stigma. About 69% of patients in a weight loss support group reported at least one stigmatizing encounter with a physician. And this data um, here in this table comes from a study done by Rebecca Poole, uh, just came out recently. Um, she basically got data from 14,000 individuals across uh, six different countries, including Australia, Canada, France, Germany, the UK, and the US. And these individuals were involved in, in a behavioral weight management program. Um, in, each, in each country, between 56 and 61% of respondents uh, reported experiencing weight stigma, and between 12 to 25 percent of respondents uh, reported experiencing weight stigma multiple times. And this is within the healthcare context. Um, so this is really quite distressing in terms of what some of our patients may be going through. Um, also, as part of this study, they looked at um, the consequences of uh, internalized weight bias. Hold on, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so essentially, weight bias internalization mediated the negative consequences of uh, weight stigma experiences in healthcare, such that um, there was a very strong correlation between internalized weight bias and several negative outcomes. Um, so people reported uh, reduced uh, checkups with their physicians, increased avoidance of doctors, um, increased perception that doctors were judging them, um, the perception that doctors weren't listening, that doctors were not being respectful, and that doctors were not providing um, basically high quality health care. Uh, so this really had a very negative impact on the quality of care uh, patients perceived. Um, so weight stigma in healthcare, you know, this, this also just kind of reinforces what we already know about weight stigma in healthcare. Weight stigma in healthcare is associated with avoidance of medical professionals, delay in healthcare, including delay in cancer screening, reduced physical activity, worse weight loss outcomes, uh, detrimental metabolic consequences, including increased hemoglobin A1C, um, CRP levels, increased hair cortisol, increased allostatic load. It also contributes to depression, um, psychological distress, and in one study even contributed to uh, significantly increased mortality. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn the slides over to Sarah and you'll hear more again from me later. Thank you, Katie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, weight stigma as it relates to cancer care specifically. And to do that, I wanted to start by introducing the topic of healthcare avoidance, because I'm going to talk a little bit about cancer screening and delays in cancer screening due to weight stigma. And so for that, I, I really wanted to introduce this topic. So when we think about healthcare avoidance, what primarily, at least for me, comes to mind is not seeking care not seeking care immediately when you need it um, and maybe avoiding make going to the doctor because because of your weight um, but it can also mean other different things it can also include denial of symptoms as well as treatment non-adherence so there's more than one way that we can manifest healthcare avoidance and so i just wanted to talk about that as we kind of think about that in terms of the next few slides and i should say healthcare avoidance can exhibit itself for many different reasons. Today, we're just going to be talking about this in the, in the context of weight. Next slide, Katie. Thank you. Um, so this is the model. I really like this model, actually. This is a conceptual model that um, is from a, an author called Mensinger and, and colleagues, uh, published a few years ago now, that really tries to bring together a lot of the concepts that Katie has been talking to you about already. So we've talked about weight, we've talked about weight stigma, internalized weight stigma and shame, 
And I just introduced you to the, the topic of healthcare avoidance. And I like this, this is a, this model, this conceptual model, because I think it gives us a framework for thinking about how all of these concepts are interrelated. So this, this study that um, we, we have all these studies referenced at the end, if anybody's really interested in looking into them. But this study, it, it, it created this conceptual model and then interviewed, I think about 313-ish um, folks for to understand whether or not this, actu this model actually stood up. And they did actually find that this model well reflected the experiences of those folks they surveyed. So folks with higher body mass index experience weight stigma, they internalized this weight stigma. And then through the process of body related shame and guilt, that leads to healthcare stress and healthcare avoidance in turn. Next slide, Katie. There are many reasons that a person in a larger body might exhibit healthcare avoidance. Um, this was, I think this may have been from the same study that I showed you previously, but um, I'm just listing some of these reasons here. Inadequ inadequate equipment, gowns that are too small, exam tables that are too small, blood pressure cuffs that don't fit. We'll talk a little bit about cervical cancer screening and an inad inadequate uh, equipment for cer cervical cancer screening in a few slides. Um, experiences of weight stigma. Katie showed you earlier how a large proportion of people in larger bodies have experienced weight stigma in their healthcare past. Um, I know I have experienced this in my healthcare past and it makes me very hesitant to go and find a new doctor. Like when I'm moving down to Iowa and now I have to find a new doctor, it makes one very hesitant to actually um, kind of go and find that healthcare provider and then kind of start that relationship. Past advice around weight loss. Um, I think we have this assumption that I think is wrong that everybody in a larger body wants to lose weight and that may not be the case. Um, there can be, and to that end, kind of when, when people receive weight loss advice that is unsolicited, that may be unhelpful. I think that can be really off-putting to somebody. I think there's um, a lot of potentially valid concerns from people in larger bodies that their concerns will be dismissed, that they'll finally kind of pluck up the courage to go and talk to a healthcare provider, or maybe they have a relationship with a provider that, that they like, but then they will go to that person and that they will, their concerns will be dismissed, that they will be just, to, oh, oh, this is a problem because of your weight, just lose weight and the problem will go away. Um, and that may or may not be the case, depending on what the root cause of that problem is. And then Katie talked a little bit about internalized fat stigma and shame. So experiences of stigma in the medical context can directly contribute to these feelings, um, as well as kind of our cultural attitudes towards weight and fatness that can be personally internalized and that may kind of stop somebody seeking the medical care that they need. Next slide, please, Katie. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, specifically about healthcare avoidance and cancer screening. And I'm going to talk through two cancer sites in, in particular. Uh, first, we'll talk about cervical cancer, and then where, where I, th I think the evidence is fairly clear and fairly strong. And then colorectal cancer, where the evidence is a little bit more mixed. So next slide, please, Katie. So this is a slide for, it's a, a little bit of an old study now, but um, it shows that larger women are less likely to receive pap testing than normal weight women. So this is for cervical cancer screening. And what we're seeing here, I'm, I'm just gonna get my finger and point at the screen, but I realize you guys can't see my finger. Um, what we can see here is that on the, the x-axis, we have these categories of obesity that Katie kind of talked a little bit about earlier. And on the y-axis, we have the odds of receiving your pap test. Um, and so what we can see is that there's a real dose response relationship with folks who are in larger bodies much less likely to receive their pap testing than quote unquote normal women. Next slide, please, Katie. Large, and from a different study, um, large women, this is showing the proportion of women who were on the left recommended that they receive a pap test from their physician. And then on the right, uh, women who upon receiving that recommendation, the proportion of women who adhered to the recommendation. 
So you can see that larger women, as we go move from left to right in the bars, um, we are increasing the BMI category. Um, and you can see that larger women are both less likely to be recommended pap smears, particularly that group in the 40 plus BMI category, this light blue on the far right, much less likely to be recommended by their physician. And I think Mary did a really good job, different context, but I think they, um, the, 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 it still holds that you know, when we recommended something from our physician, whether it be in the context of ovarian cancer or in the context of cervical cancer screening, we might be more likely to actually get that test. So women in much larger bodies tend to be less likely to be recommended the pap test and also less likely to adhere to the recommendation. And we've talked a few about a few different reasons why that might be. Next slide, please, Katie. This is another great study that actually specifically, you know, we've talked generally about healthcare avoidance and reasons why women might, um, might delay seeking healthcare. But this was another great study that talked specifically about women's concerns around cancer screening. This was a survey conducted with about 500 white and African-American women to determine barriers to gynecologic screening. And then they also surveyed 129 providers for their perspectives too. Larger women reported that they delay cancer screening tests and perceive that their weight is a barrier to obtaining appropriate healthcare in this context. Um, and then interestingly, the proportion of women reporting these statements increased significantly as the women's BMI um, increased. So they found that women with a BMI over 55 had a significantly lower rate of pap tests compared to others. And that this wasn't due to insurance. They, about 90% of the women in this study had healthcare insurance and that insurance and access wasn't really the barrier here. Instead, the barriers to actually receiving this screening are the ones that I'm showing you here in orange. Embarrassment at being weighed, disrespectful treatment from their provider, medical equipment that was too small to be functional, and again, returning to those negative attitudes of providers that women felt. Um, in terms of the providers, they, they reported that they actually had little specific education regarding uh, providing cancer screening and cancer care to larger women, and that they found it more difficult than for other patients and that they were not satisfied with the resources and referrals available to, um, to provide care for larger women. Next slide, please, Katie. Oh, look at that, I'm getting ahead of myself. So physician, this is, this is the same study. Um, physicians reported that providing care can be more difficult, but that they didn't receive education in this. Supplies were not necessarily readily available and they weren't satisfied with the resources and referrals. But something that's really heartening here in the green is that they did report that they believe obese women can be healthy. Thanks, Katie. And then this, I wanted to include this slide because I think it really um, shows us what the results of this, right? So this is a study that's looking at the five-year cumulative risk. So this is the proportion of women on the, in the left with the orange who have a diagnosis of pre-cancer and on the right in the blue who have had a diagnosis of cancer. And so here we're looking at, um, really what happens in terms of cancer outcomes as a result of this delayed screening. You can see that on the pre-cancer, the orange, the, there's a, again, a dose response relationship between a woman's weight and their likelihood of having pre-cancer. So the likelihood of having pre-cancer goes down with a woman's weight, whereas conversely, the likelihood of having a cancer diagnosis, although these, the standard error bars are bigger over here because there's I think less um, cancer diagnoses in this sample, the likelihood of having cancer increases. So what this means to me, or at least how I interpret this, is that, um, and I think how the authors concluded, what the authors concluded from this study is that larger women are less likely to receive cervical cancer screening, which can detect this pre these precancers before they come, become cancers. So they're less likely to have the precancer, but more likely to be diagnosed with the cancer. Next slide, please, Katie. 
So that's some pretty solid evidence I feel from um, in terms of cervical cancer screening. And I want to kind of show you some results from colorectal cancer screening here. So we're kind of changing, changing our perspective a little bit. The evidence for colorectal cancer screening is a little bit less clear. Um, you can see here, here we're looking at the difference in uh, rates of colorectal cancer screening overall um, among women and among men. And we're also looking at different types of screening. And you can see that, the, that only among the women, the morbidly obese with the folks with a BMI over 35 are substantially less likely to receive a, one, of these, one of these colorectal cancer screening met methods than those of normal, quote unquote, normal weight. This did not hold true for men. And the, the difference is substantially smaller when we look overall because we're kind of averaging out those men and women. Next slide, please, Katie. And then this here, um, again, is a study actually fairly recently from, from Siebert and colleagues that are looking at the odds of receiving colorectal cancer screening, guideline adherent cancer screening among men on, on the left in figure A and women in figure B. And you can see that there really was, is not, except in um, obese category three among men, there's not a sub substantial difference by obesity category in the odds ratio for receiving um, colorectal cancer screening. Next slide, please, Katie. In this study, I think this is the same study, they actually looked at reasons for non-adherence. And you can see here um, that they probed multiple different reasons, both among men at the top we're looking at and women at the bottom. And really the only place where we saw a difference among men, didn't doctor didn't order or say that I needed it. So obese men were much less likely to have a doctor that ordered the test, the screening test, or say that they needed the screening than were non-obese men. And among women, we're seeing the, the, the only significant um, reason for not being adherent to the colorectal cancer screening was it being too painful or embarrassing. And this was different between women who were non-obese and who um, were in these different classes of obesity. So potentially, I, th I think the evidence for colorectal cancer is a little bit less strong uh, it's a little bit more mixed and potentially there's a difference between men and women as to perhaps why men and or women might be less likely to receive colorectal cancer screening. Is this where I hand back over to you, Katie? Um, there are a few quotes. Uh... All right, I'll go through the quotes okay. and, then I'll, and then I'll hand back to you. Okay. Perfect. Um, so we do know from interviews with patients that weight stigma is a barrier to effective cancer care. And I, we wanted to share a few quotes. Um, we have kind of broken them down into two different, um, two different themes, if you like. Uh, the first is blame. We, in the, this study, they really talked about um, how, fo how women, people in larger bodies really felt blamed for their weight and how that was a barrier to effective cancer care. You can see the quotes here. Why would you want to carry around 400 pounds? Um, were you like that all your life? I know I'm morbidly obese if that's what you want to say. And that really fits in with what we know from other places. And in terms of it's, it's not helpful to shame larger people. They are aware that they live in a larger body and they are aware of all the things that come along with that. And so bringing shame doesn't actually help one lose weight. This middle quote, it's made me very angry and disgusted with myself because, you know, it's like I have brought this problem on myself, even though I know that non-obese people can still get this disease. And then on the right here, I feel like the gynecologist absolutely judged me. She totally berated me for my weight, made it my fault that I had this illness. And the subtext was, you know, you brought this on yourself and we'll try to help you as best we can. But, you know, it's your doing. Um, so blame really being a, a key subtext to um, a barrier, barriers to effective cancer care. And you can imagine that with these three folks that 
that their experience would definitely have maybe contributed to them not wanting to return to that provider or at the very least affected their relationship with their provider. Next slide, Katie. And then the next theme that we kind of identified in this paper was barriers. Um, and so on the left here, there was a comment when I went initially when I was hemorrhaging that it was hard to examine me because I was so big. You have to understand being an obese woman, you don't want to get up on that table. You don't want anybody to see you with your clothes off. So to me, there's, there's two barriers in this quote. There's the barrier of the personal, um, maybe internalized weight shame around not wanting to remove one's clothes and having, having one see one's body. And also from the provider's side, that there's comments about how difficult it is to treat this patient because they are larger. And then on the right, she was back in hospital on a vacuum wound dressing and they were still trying to get her up and admonishing her and berating her as if she were a lazy old fat woman that didn't want to cooperate in her own care. This is just heartbreaking to me. Two days before she died, they were still admonishing her to get up and walk those stairs and do this and that. I don't, th I don't think I can say anything more about that one. So I guess with that, I'll, I'll pass on to you, Katie, and you're going to talk about, I think now, now we've talked a little bit about what weight stigma is and its impact on cancer care. Katie's gonna tell us what she's doing about it. She's doing some really cool stuff. No pressure, Katie. Our whole team is working a bit on this. Um, but first I'd, I'd like to review some of the kind of current strategies we have for reducing weight stigma in healthcare. Um, and I will, I'll just kind of list them. So first of all, there are strategies meant to uh, kind of educate healthcare providers about weight stigma in healthcare so that we can do a better job for our patients. Um, then there are, there are interventions which are meant to build empathy, which um, I, I see that as related to education, but it's not quite you know, a cognitive component of education. Um, and then, you know, working on communication strategies to enhance how we interact with our patients. And then finally, there are some cognitive behavioral therapy um, strategies. This isn't really to reduce weight stigma in healthcare so much as to mitigate the effects and to help patients um, cope. Um, so first of all, just turning to education, I think it's really important that we um, keep in mind uh, groups such as like the metabolically healthy uh, obese. Uh, or so basically treatment is not necessarily appropriate for every patient with high body weight. Um, there are risks and benefits associated with weight loss treatment. And for individuals who are very physically active, eating a healthful diet and don't have any metabolic complications, recommendations really need to be individualized in terms of weight management. And, and I would say that individuals need their care to be tailored in terms of weight management across the board. But um, you know, especially for these individuals, there really might not be that many benefits to uh, recommending stringent weight loss regimens. Um, and I think it's important to say that there's a lot of research on there um, on what I would call fitness versus fatness. Um, this is a study by uh, Barry et al. that was uh, put out fairly recently in 2014. Um, it was a meta-analysis looking at cardiorespiratory fitness, BMI category, and mortality. And um, what they basically found is that um, among uh, individuals with obesity, for those who had poor cardiorespiratory fitness, um, the odds, the odds ratio of um, mortality was around, you know, two, 2.3, somewhere around there. Um, and this is compared to, you know, normal weight uh, individuals with good cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, but uh, for individuals who had a high BMI and they were fit, um, really the, the odds ratio didn't um, cross into significance. It wasn't significantly different. And so um, being physically active and physically fit really mitigated um, any kind of relationship with body weight. Um, some studies show that there is still a slight relationship with body weight, but really fitness has a tremendously powerful effect on uh, mortality outcomes. Um, and then I think in terms of education, it's also really important to talk about the many different causes um, of obesity. So 
there are genetic causes, including syndromic causes um, and kind of polygenic causes. Um, there, you can have hypothalamic obesity. It can be due to an underlying endocrinology disorder. Um, it can be due to medication use. Uh, in a study that uh, I was on recently with uh, Professor Mary Sarazin, um, we actually found that in the VA MOVE clinic, something like 50% of patients were on medications that contributed to weight gain. So this is a really significant factor for many individuals. Um, people who have, uh, you know, psych psychiatric issues such as depression, um, anxiety, binge eating, um, bulimia, um, and other kind of mental health disorders also can struggle with weight. Um, and finally, there are lifestyle factors. Um, but I would even say that, you know, within lifestyle, we have to really consider that lifestyle in and of itself isn't just a set of personal choices that we're all embedded in um, a broader kind of social and cultural context that really shapes the, the choices we have available to us on a daily basis. Um, you know, we have these individual factors, but we also have the behavioral settings such as communities, work sites, um, the healthcare environment, schools, you know, the, the type of homes that people live in. Um, and we also have these different sectors of influence um, kind of shaping our daily lives so government, public health, um, healthcare, agriculture, education, the media, um, land use communities, foundations, and industry. Um, so, you know, first of all, I think that to say that, you know, weight is really just an issue of calories in, calories out, and personal choice is a gross oversimplification based on all the other costs they just went over. And even within the area of personal choice, there are so many other factors that, that really contribute um, in the end. Um, I think it's also really important that we, we build empathy and try to understand people's lived experiences. Um, this is a really excellent video that was put out by the Rudd Center at Yale. Um, and it's just a 17 minute video, but um, I think it, it really goes over what it's like to um, live in someone's shoes, experiencing um, weight stigma and weight bias in healthcare and, and the kind of profoundly um, upsetting experience that can be when you go to a healthcare provider who's supposed to be taking care of you and instead face, um, face stigma. Um, and then finally, you know, there's some strategies in terms of improving communication. Um, this is uh, a slide deck that's also available through the Rudd Center, which um, has a lot of very uh, important and useful information. Um, so they looked into you know, some of the language around weight and uh, really found that patients prefer if you talk about unhealthy weight, overweight, a weight problem, a weight issue. Um, uh, maybe unhealthy weight, but that, you know, terms that were more upsetting to patients, uh, less motivating, more stigmatizing, more blaming, included things like obesity or morbid obesity, fat, chubby, um, words, words like that. And so it was really important to avoid that language. Um, in terms of, you know, improving communication, it's also extremely important how healthcare providers um, bring up this topic. Um, it's important to you know, first of all, ask permission, you know, is it okay if we talk about your weight today or ask a question about, you know, how the patient feels about it, you know, how are you feeling about your weight at this time. Um, it's, it's a much better approach than um, something that's more forceful and directive, like we need to talk about your obesity or you haven't lost weight, you know, something that's critical, we need to discuss your weight problem. Um, so those are just some, some very small tips, but I think that they can really shape the direction the conversation goes in. Um, I'd also just like to mention that uh, there is some work coming out on cognitive behavioral therapy, um, looking at how this can potentially uh, help people who have uh, faced weight stigma. Um, so this was a study, there were 72 adults with uh, obesity and elevated internalized weight bias. Um, they were assigned either to uh, a behavioral weight loss intervention alone or that same intervention in combination with um, a weight bias internalization and stigma program. So it was cognitive behavioral therapy um, to help mitigate some of this. Um, and it was a 26 week, week intervention. Um, the results were somewhat mixed. They found that um, at 12 weeks, patients uh, in this special program had lower total scores on the weight self stigma questionnaire. Um, but that effect was no longer significant at, by week 26. They did find that at weeks 12 and uh, 26, patients in this special program had lower scores on the self-devaluation subscale um, of the weight stigma, uh, the weight self-stigma measure. So there was something of an effect. Um, 
there was really no difference in terms of um, weight bias internalization, fat phobia, um, patient health questionnaire, perceived stress, body ap appreciation or quality of life. Um, but I do think this is still promising um, and potentially, you know, we might see uh, more findings in a with a larger sample size or potentially, um, you know, longer duration. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to turn to um, some of the research that our group is working on and some of the work that I've done um, with a, another set of collaborators. Um, so first of all, um, I'm working with uh, Drs. Helena LaRoche, um, Eli Perensovich, Aaron Scherer, uh, looking at weight stigma and healthcare. Um, and so we designed this weight stigma and healthcare inventory. Our objectives were to develop and validate um, an inventory to assess weight stigma and healthcare, uh, to correlate weight stigma and healthcare with avoidance of healthcare, um, and to obtain data on the prevalence of weight stigma and healthcare in the national sample. Um, ultimately, our goals are to use this inventory to track weight stigma and healthcare um, over time to use this inventory to examine weight stigma in cancer care. And that's something um, we're hoping to collaborate with um, another set of collaborators on, including uh, Sarah and, and Mary Charlton. And then finally, to develop interventions to reduce weight stigma in healthcare. Um, and essentially, this inventory consists of a section of uh, demographics, uh, as well as 24 questions divided into sections on overall experiences of weight stigma in healthcare, communication, uh, the physical exam and the clinical environment. It also includes uh, six questions on healthcare avoidance uh, and an open-ended question um, asking patients for additional comments or participants for additional comments about weight and stigma in healthcare. Um, in terms of just a few of our basic preliminary results, we found that weight stigma um, in healthcare is very strongly associated with healthcare avoidance. Um, we had a correlation coefficient of 0 0.82 with a highly significant p-value for that. Um, and then for this one slide, I'm going to turn over to Sarah again. Yeah, I get to come back for a brief encore for one slide. Um, so I wanted to, to talk briefly about some of the other things that we are working on. Um, I think Katie alluded to it, but uh, we have a group actually that, that Dr. Charlton started um, in collaboration with a few of us a few months ago. Um, Katie is part of that group. Um, I am part of that group. There's some folks from throughout UIHC um, and at other colleges at the university. And I'm sure if anybody is interested in kind of joining that conversation, we would welcome, um, we would welcome additional folks and additional faces. So this group has been talking a lot over the last four or five months now about where the research gaps are in this, uh, specifically, I mean, bo both my, Mary and myself are interested specifically in cancer care. Um, and so we've been to have a, having a lot of conversations around where the research gaps are in this field, specifically relating to cancer. So we, I talked a little bit about healthcare avoidance, weight stigma and cancer screening. And so I think we're beginning to get a fairly clear picture of, about that. Um, but it's really difficult to find any information on the impact of weight and weight stigma on receipt of guideline appropriate cancer treatment. So that's really where I'm kind of focusing my, my interest right now um, and collaborating with, with our group on things around that. We've also been talking a lot about provider education, specifically at UIHD, but also more broadly um, in terms of what our undergraduates are receiving. We have um, Dr. Lucas Carr who teaches a class on obesity at Health and Human Physiology, his, his department, and he teaches this wonderful class um, where he's really trying to, to change undergraduate perspectives, among other things. Um, he's trying to change undergraduate perspectives on obesity, and so trying to understand kind of how that impacts people's attitudes and anti-fat biases. Um, we've been talking a lot too about medical school and residency and, and where we might be doing a better job of educating our, um, our future providers on these topics. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the, the times are changing and especially younger providers, I tend to find are a little bit more open to these concepts that Katie and I have been talking about today. Um, so that, but, but this, these are things that we definitely have a lot of opportunity to work on. So that just, just to bring up a couple of things that we're thinking about, um, and then I will pass it back to Katie. 
So I just wanted to talk uh, very briefly about um, a new approach that I'm interested in exploring. I think our whole group is really interested in exploring. Um, and that is to, to de-emphasize BMI um, in, in clinical care. Um, this is a theme that emerged from some of the open-ended questions on the, um, the inventory, um, that people really uh, didn't like BMI and felt that it didn't really accurately reflect um, you know, their body and their health status. Um, so I've been doing a lot of digging in this area to try to learn more. Um, and essentially, there's, there's also a lot of critique of BMI in the popular literature. Um, you know, these stories come from NPR, um, a, a popular uh, podcast called The Maintenance Phase, uh, you know, The New York Times. Basically, all of this, um, all of this kind of questioning, well, what are we really measuring when we're measuring BMI? Because it's really just a ratio of, of um, weight and height. Um, but beyond just this kind of critique in the popular literature and individuals not liking BMI, not feeling like it fits them, there's also a lot of critique in the medical literature. Um, you know, there's this one paper beyond BMI, um, Muller et al. says, you know, BMI is a score. It's basically not biologically sound. Um, it's not really providing, you know, profound insight into, um, you know, any particular phenotype. Um, and then in another paper, um, Humphrey et al. talked about the unethical use of BMI. You know, it seemed to be regularly force-fed the idea that BMI is an appropriate method by which to measure obesity in our patients. Um, and he describes it as simplistic and glib. Um, it is obvious that obesity needs to be defined by physiological criteria based on body components within the context of the related metabolic uh, functions and disease risk. So again, really looking not just at, um, at BMI, but really looking at um, metabolic function, essentially. Um, and I think that that's, it's really important, I think, to refocus some of our care, not just on BMI, but on metabolic function as a whole. Um, so looking through the, the clinical literature, um, there actually are a, a number of um, authors kind of arguing that we should really be using BMI as a screening tool, that the emphasis needs to be on metabolic health, um, visceral fat in particular, as opposed to subcutaneous fat is known to be more metabolically active and more metabolically detrimental. And so how you carry your body weight is also extremely important. And it's something that BMI really doesn't capture. It also provides a different target for intervention. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean changing the number on the scale in the same way, as opposed to really targeting a particular, um, a particular adipose tissue depot within the body. Um, and finally, cardiorespiratory fitness, as I've already mentioned, is just tremendously important in terms of metabolic health. And if we focus too much on BMI, we really lose this incredibly important emphasis on fitness and, and the fact that you know, people who have larger bodies can be very fit and um, can, that can provide a tremendous improvement in health. Um, so this is just a slide showing um, some of the uh, guidelines um, from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Um, and I just wanted to show this to you because um, I think that you know, sometimes when individuals go to see a primary care provider, not always, but sometimes the focus is really on BMI. And I think that this slide kind of nicely contextualizes all the different things we need to be thinking about when we see people. Um, you, know, you can use BMI potentially as a screening measure, but we need to ask ourselves, you know, first of all, does this BMI actually reflect adipose tissue or does this person have a lot of muscle? That question doesn't always get asked. Um, and then more importantly, I think even than that, um, where is the adipose tissue located and, and how is it functioning? Again, visceral fat is, is much more detrimental to health than, than subcutaneous fat. And some research even shows that subcutaneous fat can have um, protective effects for health. Um, so really we should be looking for um, components of metabolic syndrome and doing a more thorough workup. Um, so we haven't, you know, uh, fleshed out all of these ideas fully, um, but, you know, our whole group is really interested in looking at um, creating a metabolic health dashboard within the electronic medical record to look at, um, to highlight, I suppose, cardiorespiratory fitness, you know, not just BMI, and then also, um, you know, when looking at adipose tissue, to really focus on the function. So looking at um, labs and components of metabolic syndrome, as opposed to just amount of adipose tissue, location, you know, again, visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat. And then to some extent, um, you know, I think it's important to talk about amount of adipose tissue, but um, I think this is actually the less important component 
of um, this kind of metabolic health analysis. Um, so with that, I think that that's the last uh, kind of content slide that uh, we have for today. Um, here are some of our references and um, we're happy to share these or pass them along. Um, and then, uh, oops, then I think we can move on to any questions. And Katie, I don't know if you've been looking at the chat, but I've been able to look at the chat <laughs> since you've been doing a lot, carrying a lot of the talking, but it seems like we have a lot of folks in the audience who are both very interested and very knowledgeable about this. So I think it'd be great Wonderful. to kind of open the floor up for discussion. Wonderful. I'll go back over the chat too. Yeah, I was gonna say, this is Rachel from the consortium. We have a lot of people dropping in good resources like books and podcasts, um, echoing support for continued education for providers at hospitals, medical schools, and nursing schools. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, and some people have even mentioned, you know, we have our state cancer plan and we don't, I don't believe have anything about weight and weight stigma and potentially we have some harmful language. Um, in there. So just as we come to like update that plan for 2023, um, that'll be something really important to include. Um, somebody had asked, or Kelly said it had said, this makes me so concerned about public health and cancer control messaging around weight. Are there certain messages actually causing harm rather than helping um, just around cancer control? I know you've kind of talked about that in your presentation, but so sorry, say, say that again. Um, it said, are there certain messages that are actually causing harm rather than helping? And are there any ways to mediate that? So I think that the excessive emphasis on BMI and weight per se is, is really detrimental. Um, you know, because again, some people can have a higher BMI, but be very, you know, metabolically healthy and very physically fit. Um, and if, if those people, if it's really just hammered at, you know, for those people, I think it's, I think it's distressing um, because if you're already engaging in all these health practices, again, you know, whether or not you're going to see a lot more benefit from additional weight loss, I think is really questionable. Um, and also, um, you know, with this kind of excessive emphasis on weight, one thing that we see in the world of weight management is that patients often have extremely ambitious weight loss goals. Like they come in and they want to lose a hundred pounds, but it's not necessarily realistic from a physiological standpoint. And it's not really necessary in terms of seeing some of the benefits um, that can accrue. You know, if someone has an unhealthy, if someone has an unhealthy lifestyle and they're at a high, you know, BMI and they change their lifestyle and they, they lose a small amount of body weight, but really change those health habits and change the, how their fat tissue is functioning. Um, they can see tremendous metabolic benefits and improvement in health. But unfortunately, if you're just looking at BMI, you know, that individual who's done a tremendous job can be made to feel like a failure. And then feeling like a failure contributes to erosion of positive health habits because um, it, it just leads into this, it's a very negative cycle with um, weight bias, weight bias internalization. And so I think reinforcing the message to patients that it's about health, not about the number on a scale. And that even if you don't ever reach that, you know, quote unquote, normal BMI category, you can still do a lot with, with lifestyle. And Katie, I think Mary and Kelly had a really great discussion about that in terms of the context of the cancer plan and maybe in the next cancer plan, kind of moving away from that language mm -hmm. that focuses on weight and focusing more on the those behaviors that you were talking about that can really lead to improving health. Totally, we're getting some thumbs up. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes, eight or 10 minutes just for questions. So does anybody wanna, come on or continue to write in the chat, any other questions? Or I would say if anybody has any um, comments too, because we had a we have a lot of expertise in this group, a lot of experiences. Yes. Um, so maybe not just questions, but if anybody wants to kind of share their, their story or their experience too. I was going to say, while we're waiting for people to hop on, I think the slide that kind of blew me away was just that um, that people weren't getting recommended cancer screening because of their BMI. It just, that blew me away. And it's very sad. 
And I, you know, I think I'll comment a little bit here on, you know, the medical training I received. Um, I, yeah. I, think that, I think that things are changing over time. I hope they're changing over time. Um, but oftentimes in terms of um, even things like, you know, you, you go in to dissect a cadaver, you know, what cadaver are you going to dissect? As I recall, like we actually were limited to certain BMI categories in terms of like what cadaver we were using. Um, and that has implications in terms of how you learn about anatomy. Um, you know, we had these standardized patients coming in so that you could learn how to do physical exams. But, you know, as, as I recall, we didn't have that many patients with higher BMI um, and there wasn't much education around, you know, say specific exam techniques to use for patients with higher BMI. I think this is getting better over time. Um, you know, by the time I was uh, in residency, there was education around, you know, using a different speculum size to do, you know, say a pap smear. Um, but I still think there's a lot of work to be done um, to really reframe like this normative body in medical education. You know, so many of the examples were taught in our physiology lectures. It's a 70 kilogram man and it's just, that doesn't really apply. Um, and I, I think we still have a lot of work to do. All right, did anybody else? I I, have yeah. one thing I just want to add, um, first of all, Dr. Robinson and Dr. Nash, thank you so much. Um, obviously, this is an uh, idea that's of interest to uh, consortium members. Um, I, I don't know if this is a question. Uh, I think it's probably more a, a comment and it's an absolute assumption. But I would get I, I find myself sitting here wondering if um, this idea is met with resistance from from some healthcare providers because it's so there's such a deep history. I mean, it's like a, a pretty big paradigm change, not only in, in healthcare, but in society even. I mean, we have such a focus on, on weight and BMI and, uh, and the ways you know that we're all used to talking about it. And I just, I don't know if there's anything to be said about it, but um, maybe is that something that you've come across too? Like, is there resistance to changing the way we talk about it? Or do we not know yet? I'm not entirely sure if we know yet. Um, you know, this is an area that I think we're just kind of, you know, dipping our toes into. I think, I think the idea that we need to be talking about metabolic health and, um, you know, physical activity and location of adipose tissue. I think that those things are are, are accepted. I think I think where there's more debate is, um, you know, the role of having you know, higher amounts of adipose tissue, you know, how detrimental is that? And I think that's where things get a bit stickier. There's um, a lot of research on this kind of phenotype that's known as metabolically healthy obesity. So essentially people who have a BMI over 30, but um, don't have metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome consists of um, having a larger waist, um, having evidence of uh, glucose intolerance. So elevated hemoglobin A1C, elevated fasting blood glucose, um, having high blood pressure or being on a medication for high blood pressure. Um, and then um, also, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the last one. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna wake up in the middle of the night with this. Um, but, but anyway, so if people who basically are healthy from a metabolic standpoint, um, but you know, are designated as having obesity. And basically, you know, whether that's a, a risk state or not a risk state, um, because I think that some people would say, well, you know, these people are healthy, even at a higher BMI, it, you know, we shouldn't really be pushing weight, weight loss interventions. There is some data that shows that people in that category have a higher tendency to convert to um, having metabolically unhealthy obesity. And so some people then argue because of that higher conversion rate, we should treat those people as having um, a medical problem even before they're diagnosed with metabolically unhealthy obesity. I think it's a really, it's kind of a strange argument in some ways because, you know, all of these things that we look at in metabolic syndrome essentially happen along a continuum. And so if you take a group of individuals who arbitrarily fall on one side of it, but are maybe a little closer to it, you know, and then you follow up in five to 10 years and they've slid over that little line. I'm not sure that that means that they, that they had a pathology to begin with, but, but this is an area that's really hotly debated um, in the medical literature right now. 
I hope that wasn't too much of a deep dive. This is an area of interest of mine. And so I could talk about metabolically healthy obesity um, all day long. <laughs> No, I think that was, that's great. Thank you. And super interesting. Um, and I, I also think along these lines though, too, like, so we talk, you, you've talked a lot about, um, what is the, is there a benefit to folks? You know, some folks don't need to lose weight to be healthy. Um, there's also the side that I think Katie, you brought up, uh, Katie Jones, you brought up about, um, the connection between, uh, weight intentional weight loss and eating disorders so it's like where is that scale are we also looking at the scale between harm at just the idea of intentional weight loss and i i think that's very fascinating too so there's just so many sides the other thing kelly that i i i'm sitting here and i really want to bring up although i i, I recognize that I'm doing so I'm going to make myself a little vulnerable because I really don't know too much about it, but I feel like I need to say something as a concept of intersectionality. And like we know, for example, that BMI, uh, well, I have very strong feelings about BMI, which I think you probably all can tell from the contents of the presentation, but we know that it is more or less relevant, um, if it ever is relevant at the individual level, but it may be more or less relevant depending on the population group, the rate, I also hate the concept of race because it's a socially derived concept, not a biologically derived concept, but it may or may not be more or less relevant for different population groups, different racial groups. Um, and I, and so I think we, we also need to be thinking about that. I, I definitely am going to admit that this is not something that I know too much about, but it's something that we should be thinking about and something that I wanted to kind of bring to the group to think about too. Great, and I, we have like one more minute left if anybody else wants to make a question or has a question or a comment. But otherwise, I was gonna say, if people are interested about this topic, like what should they do? Um, is it okay for them to reach out to you both? Okay. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And as I said, we have this kind of interest group that, that we've been starting here on campus. So if anybody is kind of interested in kind of joining that conversation. I think we'd welcome, welcome the new faces. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, I was gonna say thank you both for your presentation. It was just super enlightening and I feel like I'm not ever gonna be able to get it out of my head now and we'll see things through a different lens. So really appreciate that. Um, thank you to everybody who's stuck on with us throughout the week and participated in today's sessions. Um, we will see you tomorrow for day five, which is crazy. It's the last day. So we have our member meeting, um, awards, and then our closing speaker. That's an early onset colorectal cancer survivor. So we hope that you'll join us. So uh, check the chat for more information about CEUs if that applies to you. Otherwise, I hope you have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you.